The biggest thing, mate, is just if, if you're on the edge, just go and do something. Probably the biggest mistake you can do is sit there and wait and wait and wait. It seems to happen with, like, like I said before, market cycles where while property is cheap, while there isn't a whole lot of demand, people sit there on the sidelines. And then when all the media talks about is how house prices went up 20% last year, all of a sudden everyone wants to purchase property. Welcome back, Leverage Addicts, where we talk property investing and financing strategy here in New Zealand. I'm your host, Blandon, and joining us again on the show is a very special guest, Hadley Nightingale from New Zealand Property Buyers. And last time Hadley was here, we dived into his journey around how he started property investing and what he did to start this property agency. Now, today we're shifting gear to look at the current landscape of the property market, you know, what regions are hot, what's not, because that's where he uh, plays. And we're going to think about opportunities and how we should be looking at them, especially in this market where interest rate is very high and prices have dropped quite a bit, it's sort of stabilized now, but how do we maximize that? So Hadley is here to share some tips with us. Welcome back, Hadley. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Great great to be back. Awesome. Awesome. I thought maybe what we can do is kick off with like just a deal you've done recently. So then the audience who might be new listening to you know what sort of deals you work with and what to expect. Yeah, cool. The last deal that we did last week was actually in Fielding. So a little bit out of Palmerston North. The reason for that one was is that even though it wasn't in the major center, it's still really close. It's still at the airbase, which isn't too far away. There's some good infrastructure around it. So it had been on the market for a while and we been just been sort of sitting there and watching it. We ended up purchasing it for 635000 As we were going through the process and as it took a bit longer, rental incomes had, or suspected rents had come up as well. So we ended up getting the rents were 580 a week per unit. So two units, one title. And then what we're going to look to do is subdivide the two titles. So we get our increase in equity there as we go. So sort of looking at a, a 9% gross yield or just over 9%. And then there's sort of between 140 and 160 grand of equity one the subdivisions being cut up for them as well. So a bit of a bit of a two for one deal was the, the last one that we've done. So essentially got decent uh, yield at nine percent if rates are a bit higher, potentially looking at a neutral, slightly negative. But in the scheme of things, long term with interest deductibility coming back in and then potentially interest rate goes down, we're looking at cash flow positive maybe what, two year, two years? Yeah. These particular clients uh, had had a cash deposit, so the negative side of it wasn't there for them. But if we're doing a hundred percent finance year, we're sort of gonna look to year two or three before we start to break even. But I think that's probably one of the things with it is is that when we look at the deal as a whole, there's the hundred and fifty grand of equity that's that's there and made. But if we've got to pay a little bit for a couple of years, sort of so be it. Would you rather have 150 grand in equity or nothing as sort of the, the flip side of it with the, these type of deals? That's awesome. So a bit of a safety net as well. So you're looking for deals where you're getting a decent yield, you've got a bit of a safety margin in there so that if an interest rate were to keep going up, we still have a bit of room to breathe. Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's important. Really good. All right. So Hadley, since the last time we spoke, obviously the property market continue to change, continue to evolve. Could you maybe give us a broad overview of what you're seeing on your side because you're a lot closer to the property uh, market in terms of you know negotiation every day. Tell us what you're seeing right now. Uh, it's it's definitely quiet out there from an investment standpoint. So we if we sort of look back over the last couple of years, we look back at sort of 2021 when things were peaking. There was 13,000 houses nationally on the market. If we look today, we're up to 40,000 or 40,100 as of today. So there, there's a huge jump there. A lot of those houses that are coming onto the market are, are just single dwellings. So we're not seeing huge amounts of sort of multi unit rental stock coming on at the moment, which is, I suppose, with the amount of volume that's there, the market's a bit quieter. So it's actually, we're actually having some good negotiations now. Gone are the times where we're going to multi-offers with every property that we're looking at and that, you know, if we if we don't get it, there's going to be another one that comes up rather than turning up to an agent and agent going, well, look, the the it's on the market for 800 but you're going to have to pay 850 to get what you're after. Post it now, it's on the market for 800 Well, you know, how how close to seven fifty can can we get that property for? And then it's there, there's just not the, the same desperation in the market as, as what there was, which is uh, refreshing and nice. Yeah. So in terms of desperation, you're seeing it from the seller 
yeah. than the buyer now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so depending on who you talk to and where you are, like different pockets of the market are, are moving differently. And there's not sort of where we are anyway, there's not queues out the doors for open homes like there was, or if there are a large number, there aren't six offers being put in on, on the first day. You're having agents chasing you up going, hey, you looked at this place, you said you were interested in this last week. Are you, are you putting an offer in or, or where, you know, where do you sort of see things so it's definitely turned to that in the buyer's favor that's that's for sure so interest rate right now if you guys are listening it's sitting around that six and a half percent mark for longer term four or five years and one year is around that 6.8 6.9 my parents are just selling a place and they putting some mortgage on the shorter term what sort of yield can you expect in this current market what's realistic yeah so at the moment most of the stuff we're buying is sort of between the eight and a half and nine percent we'll occasionally get something the, so the more remote that we go the higher those yields but then you also lose the, the capital side of that as well. So somewhere in that sort of eight and a half to nine percent in the bigger centers is sort of what we're looking at. If we go below that, it's because it's more a capital gain play where we've got something that we can land bank or something that we can put a second dwelling on to lift that yield at a, at a later point. Yeah, that's awesome. And because you're working in the regions and there are certain dynamics that's quite different to say for example Auckland or Hamilton. I mean yield is one thing. What are you seeing as different in the regions and how do you define like a good region? Uh, I think population and, and infrastructure are really the two. Or, well, you know, the, the employment infrastructure that's there. How many people are there? What is, what's the likelihood of people that are going to come to that area? Is it solely driven because houses are cheap? And if houses are cheap, what else is there to support that? There's certain areas where you can still buy houses for $200,000. But having a, an empl- somewhere that's stable with employment and, and ongoing continuity is the bit that, that you shrug your shoulders and go, well, you know, good isn't always cheap and cheap isn't always good. And so for somewhere that's that's going to be good for us is like say the population there's a few core businesses there that if one shuts down there's still plenty of employment opportunity they've got some infrastructure like a railway or a port or there's forestry or there's agriculture in the area to keep the economy going. So they're really important to, to keep in mind rather than just sort of throwing the data at the dartboard and going, that, that price looks good, let's let's buy there. Yeah. And for investor nowadays, I think one of the most popular data points is Opus, like regional maps, being able to have a quick scan on like, hey, what's the trend on these particular regions? What sort of yield to expect? How does it differ from what you're actually getting clients to buy? Because often, you know, if you just look at the trend line, right, most regions are still offering like four, five, six percent. Like, how are you getting to eight, nine percent? What's allowing you to achieve that type of yield? Is something wrong with the deal? <laughs> no, nothing, nothing wrong with the deal. I think it's more so just about how you look at things. So everything's perspective, right? And it, it's one of the questions our clients ask us is like, well, what if my budget's 700 and you have another client's budget that's 700? But it's more so about like the outcome of, of what you're looking to achieve. And then the other thing with like the regional or the, the suburb medians for, for rental yielders, it tends to be dragged down by single dwellings. So, you know, or you have private landlords that under rent their, have their properties under rented. So it's basically, it's like looking at the whole data pool and going, well, this is what it must be. But like in anything, there's, you know, there's outsiders that you can pull on to lift that data either way. So I think it's important to, to know what you're looking for rather than just going, oh, well, 4% is what I should expect. So that's that's all I can get. What are some of the most popular strategies that you're seeing your investor buy? What kind of properties are they buying? What are they going for? Yeah. So predominantly we go for the multi-unit type of properties just because we can buy sort of two for one or two for one and a half rather than paying the sort of same price as you would for, for two properties. The other thing that we're doing at the moment too is looking for standalone houses where we can put a minor dwelling or a secondary dwelling on depending on district plan and things like that so that you'll have a house that you buy at say six or six and a half percent and then by the time you put the minor dwelling on you can sort of lift that to ten and then from a gross yield perspective and then by the time you you join the two up you're sitting around that eight eight and a half so you're getting very close to that sort of neutral zone but you've also had the equity increase from putting the, the secondary dwelling on as well. So it's not so much a case of what you see is what the end result is. You've always got to be thinking about what else can we do to this or what's the next stage where that we can bolster that income. And what about the cabins play? Because I know you've talked about that a few times. I've seen you do that with some of the clients as well. What sort of return do you get on cabins? And when do you decide, okay, maybe I could put a cabin on this? Yeah, so cabins are, are really area specific. So there's some markets that tolerate them really well. Others sort of don't so much. So the the East Coast, we were doing a lot of it. It's something at the moment where appetite's changing for them. So we sort of haven't done any any cabins in the last 
two to three months. And that's that's just mainly, like I say, through a, through an appetite perspective from what we're seeing in the rental market. But some of the ones that we had done, we were sort of getting upwards of sort of 10%. You get another $100 a week for putting the cabin on the back of it. Yeah, that's awesome. I wanted to ask, Hadley, what are your top five regions right now? Top five regions. I'll give you large regions. So Hawke's Bay is good. Christchurch, South Canterbury. We're doing a little bit in Southland and then also to the, the Manawatu. So that's sort of central lower North Island and then down the South Island as well. Yeah, that very much aligns with the deals that we're seeing on our side that are coming through with higher yields. That's good. And I guess what I wanted to maybe touch on as well, because you know a lot of buyers, right, they come and they're like, okay, I figured that I need to do some investing. Otherwise, I'm stuck paying my mortgage for a long time and I need to think about retirement. I need to think about my options. Now, when starting out, a lot of things are holding them back. From your experience, what is it that like a newer buyer need to overcome so that they have the confidence to go ahead? I think that the biggest thing they need to look at is looking at it from a long-term perspective. We find that with some of the newer people that we work with, that we're, we're really having to go through and show them what 10 years looks like. We're buying this property today. This is what it looks like today. This is what the next 10 years is, is, is going to look like for you. And this is how we need to sort of pan things out. I think where people get stuck is they they look at a property and they go, oh, yuck, I don't like the look of that. But they, and they can't see what a renovation would do. Or they look at it and they go, oh, I can't see the potential in it. So therefore, or, or I don't know what I'm looking for in terms of potential. So I think that limits them. And experience is probably the, the thing that's going to get them through that or talking with someone that's experienced. But just, I think the thing is they've just got to do their numbers, make sure it works for them and take that first step and complete that due diligence in terms of progressing. So let's just play a scenario here. If I was a new investor, right? I've watched enough webinars, read some books, you know, listened to podcasts and I'm like, okay, like I need to do this property investing thing. But I'm just so scared because I'm scared of like bad tenants. I'm scared that I pay too much. I'm scared that I don't know what price to offer when the deal comes. I'm scared to like have all of this headache and I've been stuck at this position for 12 months. What's your advice for me? The advice for you is, is if, if you've just been reading the, the books and listening to the podcast, you've actually got to talk to some people to get some feedback about where you are and, and where you want to go. It's probably one of the conversations I have with clients is like, look, the, the things I can control are, are the deals that we bring and you know what those deals look like. The part that I can't control is you and your fear when we get to the point where you've got to say yes or no. So I think the mindset side of things is really, really important as, as airy fairy as it might sound. But if you've got your mindset in terms of like, I know what I want, I know what I'm going to go for. If you're aware that you're going to be scared, but you just take one step forward, it, it pushes your fear barrier out a, a little bit further and a little bit further, as opposed to just sort of jumping all the way in or staying where you are. Because it's easier just to sit and listen to podcasts, go, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow, and then tomorrow never comes. Yeah, for sure. So overcoming fear, and I think from what I've seen is most fears are just in your head, right? What you really need to do is get a piece of paper and go, okay, what am I actually scared of? Then instead of just go, okay, how do I overcome it? Why not ask a question? How has someone else overcome it? Because, you know, we deal with investors every day. And sometimes, like Hadley says, you just need to talk to somebody and they have faced the same situation. How do they come out of it? Then buy two, three, four and build a proper portfolio. Those are the experience that you can draw on by talking to other people. I think too, even if you've got kids is like the prime example. When you've got your kid there and they're scared of doing something and you talk them through it, it's exactly the same scenario of you talking yourself through what you're going to do when your kid's scared to take the first step or ride their bike without training wheels. So you've got those other life experiences that you can draw on, but it's just a thing of putting that back on yourself rather than sort of externally getting someone else through it. Yeah, for sure. And I wanted to touch on as well, do you think there are some missed opportunities right now that investors are overlooking? What are the things that they're not capitalizing on, hidden gems right now in this current market? I think the thing is, is that everyone's nervous about interest rates, nervous about what's going to happen with lending. Can we get lending? And so there's definitely opportunities out there. At the moment, property prices are down from where they were on the peak. And it just, it always, seems to be the same thing that when property prices drop, everyone seems to exit the market and go and sit on the side. And then when the prices start racing, everyone goes, jeepers, I better jump in there and, and get on this before the run ends and, and I miss out. And so the thing is at the moment, there's plenty of good deals out there. It's understanding what you need and then working the deals around that. But also too, like we said before, just like thinking outside the box, just because the house looks like the house does at the moment, can we turn a third bedroom into a fourth bedroom? Well, we've just done a, a deal, we bought it in December, with which was like a three bedroom 
and the fourth bedroom, you had to go through the third bedroom into the fourth. And it was a simple case of, well, let's just put a wall in the door, then put another doorway where the wall is. And we've got four individual bedrooms and the rent goes up a hundred bucks a week for two bits of framing and a door. Was that the Gisborne one? Yeah. yeah. Ziang is our senior advisor, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So it's stuff like that that you look at and go, well, if we can be a little bit creative with this, how do we increase the yield for it? How do we increase our equity by adding another bedroom? And just being a little bit creative rather than it's advertised as a, as a three bedroom house at the moment and rents at $450 a week. And so the yield's rubbish, move on to the next. It's like, what's the bigger picture of this? What else could we do to it? That's really good. Definitely understanding some renovation techniques will help a lot. So for the people who would be interested in working with you, how do they get in touch? What are the next step? What does the process look like? Yeah. So so in terms of getting in touch with us, probably emails the the best way, Hadley at New Zealand Property Buyers.com or through our website, we've got the, the contact forms there. In terms of process, yeah, book a call. We'll have a chat to see whether we're a fit and whether we can help each other out. And if we can, great. And if we can't, it's it's always worthwhile having the conversation. Mm, that's awesome. So any last advice for our audience listening today? I think that the biggest thing, mate, is just if, if you're on the edge, just go and do something. Probably the biggest mistake you can do is sit there and wait and wait and wait. It seems to happen with, like they said before, market cycles where while property is cheap, while there isn't a whole lot of demand, people sit there on the sidelines. And then when all the media talks about is how house prices went up 20% last year, all of a sudden everyone wants to purchase property. So as Warren Buffett says, be greedy when everyone's fearful. And, and fearful when everyone's greedy. Not that I think greed's a, a great thing, but just in terms of as the analogy is, you know, when there's people out of the market, be doing the opposite thing. Awesome. Thank you so much for your insights today, Hadley. And for our listeners out there, if you guys have found value in today's episode, all we ask for is one thing, and that is to share today's episode with another person that's going to find value from it. Thank you for listening, and I'm signing out. This is Blandon and Hadley. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks.